John from Heroes and Legends, and welcome to part one of our five-part Hour of Devastation full set review. Today we're going to look at all of the white cards. We're also going to see a few of the artifacts, a few of the multicolor cards, and a couple non-basic lands. We're going to do this in five parts since it is a small set, and I want to be respectful of your time, but still give you the information you need to take down that pre-release a week from today, which is pretty exciting that it's coming up finally, right? Feels like we've been talking about these cards forever. Now quickly before we get started, if you check out the description below, find a couple ways to help support us, one of which is our Amazon affiliate store. If you make any purchases there, whether it's our devastation products or anything really, a small percentage will come back to help us out. Always goes a long way and is appreciated. Secondly, you'll find our Patreon page linked below as well, another way to help the channel. With that out of the way, let's get into the review. Now, if you've watched our reviews in the past, you kind of know what to expect here. We're going to look at each card, first and foremost, through a limited lens for sealed and draft. However, any card that maybe could cross over in other formats, like Commander, Standard, Modern, pretty well, we will talk about that too. But for the most part, a lot of these cards, in any given set anyway, are truly designed for limited play, and that's where a lot of our focus is going to be. All right, let's get into the first card, and it's Act of Heroism. So basically, cheap little combat trick for white. I only like this card under one set of circumstances if I have enough exert creatures in my deck. So whether I'm sealed or draft, if I have a few exert targets where I can mitigate that exert cost with this untap effect for two mana, yeah, you know what? Sign me up. I'll play it. I don't necessarily love this just simply as a combat trick. Sometimes it's nice to have a combat trick if you're low on removal spells. And in that case, this card will still serve you. But I think for the most part, I'm not happy to play this unless I have some exert targets. Adorned Pouncer. This card was revealed a couple weeks ago. I liked it then. I like it now. Face value, it's not super exciting. A 1-1 double striker for 2. It is a cat. Sometimes that's relevant, but that's not what makes me like the card. What really pushes this over the top for me and makes it perhaps first pickable in a draft or just a great pickup out of a seal pool is simply that internalized cost of 2 and 3. It feels very reasonable to get a 4-4 double striking zombie on the battlefield, right? So I like that aspect of the card. The tricky part, though, is getting it in the graveyard, because if you play this, your opponent is not going to want this to die. They'll be happy to take two damage for a little while so that this thing doesn't go to the graveyard. They're not going to just block it and kill it until they have an answer for it, probably, or until they need to. So that's a little bit of an issue, but if you can get past that, this is an awesome card for limited. Could this cross over into standard? Its biggest obstacle is what I just mentioned. It does play into your opponent's wheelhouse a little bit by giving them the decision of when to kill it. So that becomes awkward. However, if you have a deck in standard that has an economical way to get this into the graveyard, whether that's a discard effect, a middle effect, or a sacrifice effect, then all of a sudden this card does become very, very relevant. We'll have to kind of see where the meta goes, but this card at least has a chance at getting some standard play. Angel of Condemnation. Uh, this one is good and limited. Really happy to play this. This could be a early pick, maybe first pick in some packs of draft. Great and sealed as well. Here's what I like most about it. 3-3 three, three, Flying Vigilance for 4. Even if it's 2 on color, I'm really happy to play this card, actually. The abilities are a little awkward for me. Um, sometimes they're good, and you just have to think of them as bonuses that are just stapled on there, quite honestly. But that first one, I can tap it, exile a creature, at least temporarily in this case, so that, I don't know, maybe I can get a few extra points of damage across, maybe I can exploit an entrance battlefield effect, something like that. It's a little awkward that it's tapping itself to do it, though, because then you can't attack with it or block with it if you need to. I don't necessarily love that. The second ability is good if there's a creature on the battlefield that you need a more permanent answer to, or at least quasi-permanent answer to, and you just have to get rid of it, at least for right now, until you find a better answer. Again, it's real slow. You're tabbing this. You're exerting it to do that. That's not going to feel good, considering this is going to be probably one of your better creatures for offense and maybe even defense. So the abilities, yes, awkward, but at the same time, it's still really good. It's just a good creature, even if the abilities weren't there. Because the abilities are slow, I don't really see this doing anything in the world of standard or anything like that. Uh, but again, like I said, fine limited card. 
Angel of the God Pharaoh. Classic limited only card. It's just fine. It's not a high draft pick. Maybe you get this middle of the pack, even sometimes later in a pack. Uh, it's a 4-4 four, four flyer for 6. doesn't feel really good, but it's a nice-sized creature with evasion, and if you stumble on mana, you can cycle it away. So it'll be just fine. It'll do some work for you. Even of Enduring Hope. Now, this one, a little smaller. You're paying 5 for a 3-3 three, three flyer. You gain some life with it, 3 life. Now, there's a lot of this incidental life gain in this set. We're going to see a card in just a moment that tries to exploit that a little bit, but the card is a mythic, so it's not going to show up a whole lot. So basically, when does this life gain become important? If you're up against an aggro deck, and there's a lot of good aggro strategies in this set as well as Amonkhet. I mean, for those of you who played Amonkhet, a lot of times, especially if you play Sealed, they do feel relatively quick. Like some of those games do unfold fast. There's a lot of aggro decks out there. I don't see anything changing with this set. As a matter of fact, this set doesn't really change the mechanics or really what's going on that much as much as it just simply contributes to them. So all the stuff you're familiar with from Amonkhet is still kind of here. They added the deserts to add maybe another level of complexity, and I think that's actually kind of cool. But you're not going to see a vastly different environment, I don't think. So keep that in mind. When it comes to life gain spells, they're okay, but I'm probably not main decking a lot of them just because if my opponent's not playing aggro, they're not all that good. I might sideboard them in against aggressive builds. Now this card at least still is a 3-3 flyer on top of it. It might not always make your cut, but if you need a 5 drop that has some evasion and is at least a decent size, it's definitely playable and limited. Crested Sunmare. Now here's the card I just alluded to, of course. It's interesting. I love the card, and I kind of joked around the other day when it was previewed that I really wanted to see this card do well because I think it's an amazing design, amazing art. I just love tribal stuff in general, and I think a lot of players do. Now, they went real deep this time with tribal horses, and I think that's kind of awesome. But let's take all that away for just a minute and talk your draft and sealed. A 5-5 five, five for 5 in white? You know what? I'm probably playing that. The other stuff on top of it definitely makes it a nice pickup. So let's say you're lucky enough to open this and pack one of a draft. You take it, and then you just go ahead and keep building a good deck. See what comes at you. Of course, try to be in white if you can. And if you can pull it off, then at the end of your packs, you'll probably see a lot of these incremental little life gain spells showing up. And no one else is going to want them. You'll pick them up in the late portion of packs and actually get a lot of value. Now, it's kind of a plan B for your deck. You don't want that to be your plan A because that is contingent on always getting this card out and having it survive, right? And that could be a little tough at times. But if it's a plan B for another deck that is functioning pretty well, you could have a really, really good deck on your hands. So yeah, this is great for you in limited. Could it cross over in a standard? I want it to. I just don't really know if it will. I said this the other day, but prove me wrong, folks. If you can <laughs> prove something to make this work, I would be very happy. My concern with it just on surface value is, like, if I play this with a bunch of gain life cards or incidental gain life cards, I don't know if there's really anything economic enough to make them good in the absence of each other. So in other words, I got this five drop. Even if I have four of these in my deck, I play this card if I don't have my life gain spells to back it up at the right time, then it's not doing a whole lot. And the other way around, if I get all my life gain spells and not this card, my deck's not doing a whole lot. So it feels a little too contingent on the timing and the order the cards come out. That usually is a recipe for disaster when you're talking about competitive standard, especially this standard that is hyper competitive with so many cards to choose from, right? So like I said, prove me wrong. I'd like to see this card do good. Another place this card could shine is Commander. I mean, we haven't seen Tribal Horse decks or anything like that in the past, and I don't necessarily know if that's the best way to go with this, but there are a lot of interesting Tribal elements that you could introduce into certain Commander decks. There's a lot of horses that have been printed in the past, not to mention Changelings that are out there, so I think you could brew something quite interesting with this card, actually. The last thing I was thinking about, and this came up too in the comments section back when the card was previewed, was maybe Soul Sisters. Could this be the top end of a Modern Soul Sisters deck? Maybe. I would at least want to test it out. I feel like there's some potential there. Dauntless Avon. Uh, this one I'm not super excited about. I like it in one circumstance. If I have a lot of Exert creatures. If I have Exert creatures and I can cheat an Exert cost here and there with a card like this, 
then I'm on board. Sign me up. I'll be happy to play it and seal the draft. But if I don't have that going on, or at least not enough of it for it to matter for me, then I'm probably going to skip this. A 2-1 flyer for three, even with this ability, it just isn't economical enough. There's better things you can be doing unless you can exploit the ability. Desert's Hole. Now, this is the opposite spectrum. Great card in Limited. First pickable in a lot of packs in Draft, I think. Basically, ignore that first part, and this thing is an Arrest. Arrest is a great card. You'll be happy to play it all day long. Now, if you want to dip into maybe a little bit of this Life Gain gameplay and the Desert gameplay, then awesome. You get a little bonus, and that's fine, too. But it doesn't matter, quite honestly, at the end of the day, I'm playing this regardless. Disposal Mummy. The first time I saw this card, I read it as Disposable Mommy, which I think could be an amazing card in the future, too. So, Mark Rosewater, if you're listening, make that. Now, anyway, this is a good limited card. Like, not too much to say about it. There's a lot of graveyard hijinks in this set. There's Aftermath, there's Eternalize, of course, and Amiket you had in Bomb. So, there's targets for a card like this. And a 2-3 three for 3, and it's a zombie, sometimes that will matter. That's just fine. Like, I'm happy to play it, and maybe it hits something in a graveyard sometimes. Maybe sometimes it doesn't. It's going to feel real good when it does. <laughs> so, yeah, this is a good card. Good three drop. Juro's Renunciation. Uh, this one, not super high on again. Uh, here we go with an instant tap things down. It does have cycling, so I will give it that. Cycling for one, even if it's on color, is kind of nice. But, I don't know, I'm not super excited about the card because it's very situational. It can defend you for a turn if you're trying to buy time to stabilize. It can tap down a couple problematic blockers if you're trying to do some extra damage. But at the end of the day, I'm coming up with very specific scenarios. <laughs> and whenever you start coming up with two specific scenarios for cards, they're probably not good cards. And this one, I think you can find better things to do with the two drop in most your decks. Juro with eyes open. This one's interesting. Let's talk about Sealed and Draft first. 4-3, uh, Vigilance for 5. It's okay. Like, sometimes you'll be happy to play that if you need some creatures. You don't have any better 5 drops. It's not a bad one. Sometimes you'll have better stuff, and you might not play it. But other times you'll play it, and it's, it's just fine. If you happen to be lucky enough to have a Planeswalker this card becomes incredible. And I don't really care about the prevent damage to your Planeswalker. I mean, that's cool. Don't get me wrong. It's fine to have. But being able to tutor for your Planeswalker in a 40-card deck is huge. Basically, it gives you two opportunities now to hit that Planeswalker. Again, that's not going to happen all the time. But when it does happen, this is going to be a fantastic card for you. So, like, if you're lucky enough to open a Planeswalker in, like, pack one or two, and you open pack three, and this is staring at you, then this will be a good pickup, a great pickup for you. Uh, could this cross over into standard? Maybe. It only will, I think, if there's a deck that's really dependent on getting its Planeswalkers out of the library and into their hands, right? And if a deck really, really, really needs to do that, then this could be a part of that. We were talking about, just a few months ago, Gideon Tribal decks and stuff like that. They never really came to be. But could a card like this make a deck like that more consistent? I don't know. That's a long shot, but something that I would at least maybe want to think about, and I'm sure someone will try to brew something, could be interesting. Dutiful Servants. Uh, this card is really cool because it's an art swipe from those who serve, from Amonkhet. And things have changed a little bit, of course, in Amonkhet, and the zombies are still going about their business, doing their job, and of course the world's falling apart around them, and I just love the flavor here, if nothing else. Uh, they have one more point of toughness than those who served did, same casting costs, still zombies, everything else still the same, and if you played with the Amonkhet card, you kind of know what it's good for, like it doesn't always make your cut, but if you're trying to slow down the game, or you're up against an aggro deck and you want to sideboard it in, it definitely has its role. Gideon's Defeat. Purely a sideboard card. But it's an awesome sideboard card. <laughs> the second you see your opponents on white, you go ahead and sideboard this card in. You'll be real happy you did. One casting cost instant exiles the creature. Has to be a white creature, of course. Exiles it and also has to be attacking or blocking. So you do have to set it up a little bit. And then there's a whole game life if you took out a Gideon Planeswalker, but that's not going to be very relevant very often. Nice bonus. It's there, though. All right. But yeah, put this in against white decks. 
you'll love it. That's all I really got to say about it. Could this cycle of cards see play in standard? Uh, at times, I think maybe all of them could. It just simply depends on what decks are prominent in the meta, and at any point, these could be sideboard cards in standard during their lifetime, too. God, Pharaoh's Faithful. Um, this is a nice little blocker if I'm trying to slow down the game, or again, I'm up against an aggro deck and I want to board something in to slow things down and protect myself early on. Has a little bit of life gain potentially, but I'm more interested in the fact that it's a 0 4 1 drop. Again, it's going to block those early 2 twos, those early 3 twos that are coming at me from those aggro decks. Hour of Revelation. Well, here's a huge sweep. I mean, this thing destroys all non land permanents. Color requirements can be a little tough to pull off, though, with three white. Is this a good draft or sealed card? I think it is in certain decks. You do have to feel comfortable about casting the three white portion of the card. So if you're getting too greedy, you're trying to go three colors or something like that, then I'd probably skip this one. But if you're in a two-color deck or a deck that's maybe at least half white or so, then yeah, I'd play this. And again, you might not need a card like this if you're ahead, but that's just fine. If you're behind, it's a great panic button, and you know it's in your deck, you know it's in your hand, you can play around it better than your opponent can, at least before they see it the first time. So there's definitely some advantage to just having it there. And overall, I think it's a very strong card. I like this cycle of cards, these hour of cards, and we're going to see more of them as the week goes on. Uh, could this see some play in standard? I do think it's a little slow for standard. I feel as if there's just better sweep smells out there right now we're actually gonna look at some good ones later in the week too so keep that in mind i do think this could excel in commander though because this could really decimate a multiplayer game quite effectively if you needed it to mummy paramount nice little two drop for two i mean bears with upside are good this thing's a zombie sometimes that'll be relevant and when other zombies enter the battlefield it gets a little temporary boost certainly nothing wrong with that the two spot and the three spot of your curves are vitally important in draft and sealed. You need to have some early plays to protect yourself and get that early damage in. So these little two drops that do a little bit of work are sometimes really great cards in your deck. Oketra's Avenger. Another good two drop. Like, happy to play this a lot of the time, I think. Some people don't like the three ones. They feel a little fragile. But three ones for two, I like playing them. I play them a lot. Sometimes you steal some damage with them. Other times they just trade up and take out a three drop or even a four drop. And I feel like that's economical enough. This one has the extra ability that you can exert it to prevent damage to it, which really makes combat difficult for your opponent. Sometimes they might have to bite the bullet and take three more damage. That's a nice little chunk of damage. So yeah, I'm happy to run stuff like this in both sealed and draft. Oketra's Last Mercy, another card that's part of a cycle, and the drawback, of course, for all these cards is your lands will not untap during your next untap step. This one changes your life total to your starting life total. Now, look at it this way. It costs three. You're not going to play this early on. Like, hopefully you don't need to play this on turn three. You're having a bad day, and this isn't going to be enough to save you. <laughs> but if you play this, like, on turn seven or eight or something like that, you have extra mana available to you that you can hold some of that back, of course, for the next turn. So even if those three lands don't untap, then you got the extra life to play with, and you don't necessarily lose your next turn completely, right? And I kind of like that. So... Yeah, it is a big drawback at times, and you do have to take that into account. But I think this is such a huge life swing that this card is important to recognize. I'm usually not a big fan of just gain life spells, but anything that could gain like significant life, I start to pay attention to. And this is definitely one of those cards, especially good against aggro decks that are going to hit you early, and then maybe you can stabilize and get that life back. Another thing I want to point out about this card, because when it was first previewed, there was a lot of confusion, and I tried to help some people out in the comments section, but the way the game interprets this in the rules is if I'm lower than my starting life total, so say a normal game of Magic 20 Life, if I'm at 5, for example, and I play this card, the game interprets that as I'm gaining 15 life. So any cards that interact with life gain will interact with this. If I'm above that total, if I'm at 25, it's 
thinking that I'm losing five life, basically. So keep that in mind. It sometimes will be important, sometimes it won't matter. I also want to point out that in Commander, where you start off with 40 life, that could be a super big life swing. So definitely keep that in mind, too. Uh, could this cross over into Standard? I don't really see it. Maybe if aggro decks just get out of control and players need a sideboard card that can stabilize the meta a little bit, maybe. But I think that would be about it. Overwhelming Splendor. Now this one is a mythic, and I joked around last week when this was previewed that basically this is the card you play in Commander against that deck that you hate. Like, hey friend who's playing Slivers, here you go. <laughs> and I'm that guy that plays Slivers, so I'll probably be looking forward to this card in my future, but <laughs> um, that's what it feels like to me. It's a little overcosted for most things. I mean, could you swing it in a game of Sealed or something like that? Yeah, you could. It is eight read game one though right and if the game's moving too fast sideboard it out but it is a big play if you can get it off it's a little expensive but maybe if you're playing selesnia with some ramp it becomes a little bit better and a little more achievable in either draft or sealed i'm not necessarily first picking this or anything in a draft this is something maybe if i end up with it and i find a way to make it work cool but again it's more of a plan b than a plan a for me hopefully and other than that, Commander, like, it's kind of funny, though, because you play a card like this, sometimes it turns you into the bad guy and turns people against you. And also keep in mind, in Commander, players are going to have naturalizes, disenchants, nature's claims. Like, this is a temporary thing that isn't going to be forever, and you might have to face the backlash. Sandblast. Uh, this one is a reprint from Fate Reforged. Uh, it's a fine card there. It's a fine card here. Like, I'm not first picking it necessarily, but... It's good white removal. It's a little conditional like white removal usually is, but it's just fine. Saving Grace. This card is interesting. Like, I'm not super high on it. This is the type of card that maybe is better in multiples and almost like a fog in some ways. But what it's doing for you is you flash this in and you can basically like pry on one of your creatures. So it pulls the damage off you, your other permanents and goes to that one creature. It also buffs their toughness a little bit. Sometimes it'll matter, sometimes it won't. So it's interesting. I mean, there's situations where, yeah, your opponent goes in for that like last strike, leaving themselves open, thinking they're going to defeat you. And you pull this out kind of like a fog effect, and then you snap back and win. Yeah, I don't know. It feels very specific. <laughs> so I don't really see myself playing it, quite honestly. Solemnity. Now, this card is not messing around. This card is already starting to impact the market. Tomorrow, we're going to do a market watch, and we'll definitely talk about it. So, uh, yeah, this card does so much. There's two sides to it for me. One side is this is a hose card. Like, this is completely a way to deal with people that are playing, I don't know, energy and standard is probably the best example because it is such a big deal right now with all the energy decks. But maybe even, in fact, in, well modern although you don't see it as prominently now or perhaps in commander plus one plus one counters decks which are actually pretty popular right there's a lot of things you can do to kind of hose and shut down somebody's progress on the flip side though this card's an enabler and it can enable a lot of strategies things like persist strategies by not allowing the minus one minus one counters to go onto your card so that those persist creatures are really hard to deal with right that's probably a real simple example but the list can go on and on and on. I mean, this affects everything from uh, things like Dark Depths, for example. And that was one of the things I wanted to talk about that for just a second, because there's a lot of confusion about that, too. Initially, some folks, when they first saw this card, interpreted that if something was entering the battlefield with counters, that that would still happen. But that's not the case. And I can confirm they did not change the rule with the rules changes that came out today. I did check that specifically because I thought maybe they would, but they didn't. So it does work with things like Dark Deaths, for example. Now, there's better ways to do it like Thespian Stage, but maybe this is a redundancy in a deck that's trying to do that. I don't know. Another thing you could do along that same vein in some ways is cumulative upkeeps, because when they did the change to those rules for Cold Snap, they started using counters, age counters, to keep track of cumulative upkeep. So any card with that ability on it now doesn't get the counter. So basically that just kind of gets nullified. <laughs> so that's kind of crazy too. Like just in a few minutes, I listed what, like six or seven things. <laughs> There's so many more things out there. I could probably do a whole video just on this card if I wanted to. So where does it fit in? As far as limited goes, 
there isn't always going to be a good reason to play this. Maybe it's a sideboard card if you feel like it can hose your your opponent. For example, they're playing like minus one, minus one counter strategy or something like that. Like that could really mess with them. So yeah, board it in there. As far as standard goes, again, I think this will be a board card. It really knocks energy down quite a bit. And I think at least initially, while players are still trying to get away with playing energy decks, this card will definitely be coming out of boards, no doubt. And think of it to modern, legacy, maybe even vintage, who knows. Like, this card has so many crazy interactions, it really could show up anywhere. Commander, there's a million crazy things you can do with this card. We've talked about some of them, but again, it's going to see play everywhere. Right now, the pre-release price of this card is about $5, which actually feels affordable considering the hype behind it. The card is already impacting the secondary market with some of the combos that I mentioned and many, many others. <laughs> so this is a card that's going to have a huge impact on the game of Magic itself. Maybe the biggest card we'll talk about today, probably the biggest card in the set, quite honestly, when you look at it from that perspective. Solitary Camel. Oh, we went from a card that is crazy sweeping to a card that's maybe not as sweeping, but has some credible art. And it's a good card. I mean, it's a good limited card. A 3-2 for 3. Even if you're not playing a desert sub game, then it's still a good creature for you and limited. You'll be happy to play it. And if you can turn it into a life linker, even better. Steadfast Sentinel. Uh, this is not super exciting for me. The low end feels a little too expensive. The high end feels a little too expensive. In other words, I don't want to pay four for two, three vigilance, and I don't want to pay six for four, four vigilance. <laughs> so it's kind of in this kind of awkward spot that if it was maybe one cheaper on either side, it becomes a much better card, but maybe that would have been too good. I don't know. So, is it playable in draft or seal? Yeah, it's playable. If you need a creature, it's there for you, and it's a fine four drop. Like, there's probably worse things you could be doing, but definitely not the best thing by far you could be using. Steward of Solidarity, another card that is a 2 2 with upside. The upside's fine. It's a little slow, but again, I like playing two drops for two, and a lot of times these will just simply make my build because they are two twos for two and no other reason. This case, yeah, I can exert it if I want to get a 1-1 white Vigilance Warrior token. Sometimes that will be important, other times it won't. It's a little slow to exert it to get just a 1-1, I think. Sunscourge Champion, another card that gives you a little bit of life gain, which is interesting. Uh, this one is just fine. A 2-3 three for 3 even gains you a couple life when it comes into play. So economy-wise, this is a very playable 3-drop. The Eternalize is interesting on this one because it's 2 white and 2 discard a card. So you will be getting a 4-4 four, four with no evasion, but you'll gain 4 life, which between that and the 2 you already gained is 6 life. That's actually a big chunk of life when you start thinking about it that way. Again, I feel like this card is maybe a lot better against an aggro deck, but it's definitely playable just generally. Now that discard doesn't necessarily have to be a complete drawback. Again, in this environment, there's things that interact with your graveyard, and those could be deserts, for example or maybe just an embalm or an eternalized creature or an aftermath card. So you can mitigate that at least some of the time a little bit, uh, but not all the time. So just keep that in mind. Unconventional tactics. Uh, this one's interesting. I kind of wanted to like this card. And then the more I thought about it, I was like, eh, I don't know. Is it that good? Here's the thing. I love cards that just keep reoccurring, right? Like <laughs> here you go. Give something plus three, plus three, and flying. This goes to my graveyard. Later, I play a zombie, and if I have another white, I get it back to my hand. I get to do it again. It feels good. But then I started thinking, wow, I don't know. Is that always going to happen? It started to feel like I was jumping through too many hoops to get this to happen. So if I have a lot of zombies in my sealed or draft deck, probably more so my draft deck, then, yeah, I, I could see myself running one of these and being happy with it. Probably no more than one, but I think if I had one and I had a lot of zombies to target to bring it back then yeah, sign me up. I'm going to include it. And I'm at least going to try it out. Other than that, I don't necessarily see this crossing over into standard or anything. I feel like it might be a little too clunky there. Vizier of the True. This is a 3-2 for 4. I'm usually not a big fan of those, but this is an Exert Matters card. And even if I don't have other Exert creatures and I'm just playing this card and exerting it, there are times where you can find some economy there. Taps down your opponent's best blocker, get some extra damage across, 
it's a little slow, but that feels interesting to me. Interesting enough to play it and feel pretty good at the four spot with this card. Now, if I have more Exert creatures, yes, this is an automatic sign me up. I'm happy to do it. So again, in Sealed, you might be able to play this and maybe one or two other Exert creatures and it could be okay for you. But in Draft, if you draft a lot of Exert creatures over the course of the three packs, you could have something nice on your hands here. So this is definitely a build around card as well as a good card on its own. Unraveling Mummy. Uh, this is a fine limited card again. A 2-3 three for 3, even though it is two different colors. It is a zombie that will matter sometimes. It can enhance other attacking zombies or itself. And yeah, it's a little pricey to do it, but if you have the mana, especially later in the game, this actually could be decent. I mean, giving this thing even lifelink and or death touch at any given time, even if you didn't have any other zombies to target, could be good enough for 3 mana. It feels like the economy is there in this card. It might not be something you always play, especially if you don't have a lot of other zombies, but I think it's actually good enough, especially if you are on like the Eternalized plan and you're going to have some 4-4 tokens later on in the game that are zombies. This could be quite good for you in those circumstances. I don't really see it crossing over into Standard or anything like that. It's just a little too mana intensive and situational, but I think it could be good. Maybe better in Draft again if you can draft more zombies as opposed to Sealed. All right, here's a split card with farm to market. Uh, the farm part, I mean, fine for white. White removal is usually a little conditional. This one's a little conditional, but it's going to be just fine for you. If you need it, it's there. And the market side, if you happen to be also in blue, you get to do a double loot. I like looting. Why not do a double loot if I got nothing else to do with my man at some point in the game? Could help you dig into your deck a little deeper and get ahead and just kind of pace yourself better. So yeah, I think it's a fine card. Happy to run one of these, say, in a lot of my sealed decks or my draft decks. Leave to Chance. Now this card is actually really intriguing to me. This got previewed yesterday. I've been thinking about it a lot. And I found a few applications potentially for it. But I'm not completely sold. So <laughs> let me kind of give you my thoughts. Uh, the first thing I thought of is modern, maybe with Seismic Assault. Like at some point, pick up a bunch of your lands, start pitching them at people. Seems like that could be fun. Now, I haven't played Seismic Assault decks or anything in modern. So it's maybe a little bit of a stretch for me to say that. But I at least want to test it out. Limited. This is where I was pretty interested in this card, whether it be draft or sealed. What if you are just getting mana flooded? And that happens. We've all been there. You got like 10 lands to play. You're losing board state every turn. Your opponent's playing stuff and you just can't get anything. Well, if you happen to draw this card, play it at the end of your opponent's turn and maybe you return four of those 10 lands to your hand and then next turn play the red and three chance side, pitch those four lands for four new cards, hopefully draw into some heat, maybe stabilize, that could be interesting. Now, again, that's a very specific example, but there's other things you can do with the card too, like try to exploit enters the battlefield effects, for example. So there's things going on with this card that are interesting enough that I feel like if I had it, I'd probably try to play it in a lot of decks, maybe not all, but at least a lot of decks, especially if I had some enters the battlefield effects to back it up. Standard, could it see play? Well, there's a lot of interesting board sweeps out there, so maybe out of the sideboard deal with some board sweeps. So I guess we'll wait and see on this one. Like I said, I have a few ideas for it. I'm not completely sold on any of them. I want to try this card out. It feels like it has a lot of potential. All right, let's look at a few artifacts. Uh, this one is Abandoned Sarcophagus, and I'm really interested in this card. Much like the last one, like I have a lot of ideas about it. Like I want it to be good. I hope it's good. <laughs> I feel like it could be under certain circumstances. The drawback is it could be slow. It might be too slow in some situations. But in other situations, I feel like it could be just fine. Like, if I'm in draft or sealed, and as long as I'm not going up against a really hyper-aggressive deck or something like that, turn one, I cycle a card. Turn two, I play like a two-drop. Turn three, I play this. It's already replaced itself because now I can play that card I cycled turn one out of my graveyard. Like, that's kind of crazy when you think about it. You play this later in the game, if you have a lot of cycling cards in your deck, they all of a sudden become available to you. <laughs> It feels like you just drew a bunch of cards and didn't hit lands, right? <laughs> like, that feels like it could be really good. So again, at times it might be slow because, yes, you're taking the turn off to play this, and then you're not capitalizing unless you're cycling the card and then playing it out of your graveyard, and you might not have the resources all the time to do that, at least do it in a timely manner. So you got to think about those things. But I feel like this could be a good draft card if you just go ahead and draft a bunch of cycling, like get into that blue-black cycling deck, this could complement it extremely well. 
Now, it's not for all decks, probably, but again, if you have enough targets for it, yeah, I'd be happy to try it out in Limited. Could this see play in Standard, like maybe in like the New Perspectives deck? I haven't played that deck first hand again, but I feel like there's a chance maybe the deck would want it. Don't know if it's fast enough or not, but I think it's worth at least trying. So this is one to watch in the future. Also think about like some of the old cycling cards in the past, because there's some powerful ones out there. You'll have some great interactions in Commander, if nothing else. And another kind of weird rules thing that came up in the comments section that I know caused a lot of confusion is other types of cycling, like basic land cycling, for example, is considered cycling. So if you're using a card that says basic land cycling, that does count for this effect as well. Crook of Condemnation. Uh, this is interesting. It reminds me a little bit of Relic of Progenitus. And will this replace Relic, like Modern and Legacy? No, I don't think so. In some ways, it's better than Relic, but in other ways, it's worse because it's just more mana intensive. And I think that's a big problem when you start talking about some of those older formats. Now, for Standard, however, it's great. I think you can definitely sideboard this in against any deck that's trying any sort of graveyard shenanigans. This completely hoses things like Delirium. So I think that's really important to mention that I feel like this card is one of those cards that's trying to put the past behind us a little bit and take out some of those mechanics from some of the older sets like the Innistrad block and things like that. So that's interesting. It's going to propel the meta ahead, which I think is nice. But it is still also a card that plays well against some of the new cards, like the Embalm cards and the Eternalized cards and stuff. So yeah, I do think it will see play out of sideboards there. And I think this is a very good sideboard card too, even in limited games, if you're up against those strategies. Dagger of the Worthy. I'm not a huge fan of this one. I feel like the equipment cards in Amonkhet in this set. Oh, there's only, I think, one in Amonkhet, right? And just one in this set, too. So there haven't been many of them, and they haven't really been pushed. They're kind of a side thought, I think. This one, okay, pay two, two to equip, give something plus two plus zero, and afflict one. It's not the worst thing in the world, but I feel like if I want to pay two and then two again, I might as well just be playing a couple two drops, maybe more so than this. There are creatures this interacts well with, and if you have enough of them in your deck, then by all means, run this. But if you don't have good targets for this, I'd pass it up. Let's look at a couple of the non-basic lands, and there's a cycle of these. This is Desert of the True. It's a desert that will give you white mana. Now, it does come into play tapped, and the, I guess, benefit, though, is you can cycle it away for a white one. So that's kind of interesting. The only reason I'm probably playing this, though, is if I'm all in on kind of a desert sub theme so if i have a lot of cards that interact with deserts this is kind of nice i can easily get it into my graveyard if i cycle it or i can play it and get it on the battlefield so it kind of works both ways and yeah it also gives you the white mana so it doesn't mess up your color requirements especially if you're getting greedy trying to go three colors then you don't have to worry about a non-basic lands coming to play giving you colorless mana slows you down a little bit though because it does come into play tap so it's all give and take but there's certain times where it'll be fine for you it's something you can pick up probably late in a pack dunes of the dead now this one's a little faster it doesn't come into play tapped but it doesn't help your color requirement because it only gives you colorless mana so this is probably better to play in a deck that's a little more stable like a two color deck in that case you can play this and still meet that desert requirement and if you can find a way to get it into your graveyard, then wonderful. You have a desert in your graveyard, and you get a 2-2 black zombie creature token. So again, not for all decks, but if I'm into that desert theme, this will be just fine for me. The zombie, I mean, that could be nice in some circumstances, but I think that's just kind of supplemental. Shafet Dunes. Now, this card is an interesting alternative to the one we saw a few moments ago. If you are into the desert mechanic, and you're worried about color requirements of your deck, and maybe speed of your deck... This is a little nicer because it doesn't come into play tapped. It taps for colorless mana, but if you tap and pay a life, you can get white mana out of it if you need to. Now that extra ability is okay, it's nothing exciting, but more or less two white and two, a little expensive, but it does allow you to sacrifice this and get into your graveyard. Sometimes that's going to matter, and the ability you get is okay, I guess, in some decks. If you're going wide, maybe you have a lot of zombies or something, that ability isn't always the worst thing in the world, but... Again, for that cost, it's not super exciting. This is a very strict utility card. Beyond its interaction with the desert mechanics, there's probably not a lot of use for it. So if you're going to interact with deserts and you want something like this, wonderful. If not, you'll probably pass it up. Having said that, those are the cards for today. And 
Tomorrow we're going to be back with all the blue cards. I'm actually going to try to work in a episode of the Market Watch tomorrow too. I usually skip those when I'm doing set reviews, but I know a lot of players rely on those every week. So I'm going to try to push two videos out tomorrow. So wish me luck. I'm going to try to do it anyway. And then on Sunday, of course, we'll continue our set review and Monday we'll continue our set review. Once I wrap up the set review midweek, we'll do a pre-release primer. We're going to talk about what to expect if it's maybe the first time you're going to pre-release, but we're also going to talk about the invocations in that video. And then I have a couple more market watches coming up later next week. We're going to do our July picks of the month video. And then on Friday before the pre-release evening, we're going to talk about the cards of Hour of Devastation. So you know what you're opening value wise when you go to your pre-release. Saturday, we'll do our regular market watch. So there's a lot of content coming up. Until next time, hey, thanks for watching. Please remember to like and subscribe, and have a great day. Hey, thanks for watching. This video is made possible by the generous support of viewers like you on Patreon. Check out the description below for links to our Patreon page as well as our Amazon affiliate store, where a small percentage of all sales will also help support the channel. Finally, if you haven't had a chance yet to subscribe, hit that subscribe button so you don't miss any new videos on Heroes and Legends. Talk to you again soon, and have a great day.